Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are doing the thing again tonight. How are you guys? Are you excited to do the thing? Hell I'm yeah. Excited. We are doing the thing. I, I but this time... Static. I see what you did there. Alright, welcome back to our brand new Mage the Ascension Chronicle. No fear for the wide awake. That is the name I'm going with. Um, now still don't have to have... add it to the character sheet. What now? Now it has to get added to the character sheet. Uh, I'm still working on the overlay for everything, so we're uh, we're doing this a little bit fly by night, but I'll have it together for next session. Also, before anybody asks, no, Josh's Changeling uh, Chronicle is still going. My Star Wars campaign is still going. It's all still happening. We're just doing Mage right now. So, uh, indeed, and it is Halloween. I guess Mage is not the most uh, Halloweeny of the World of Darknesses. Is is is, is, is. I mean, no, but I mean, we're we're all playing pretend, dressing up as witches and wizards and shit. That's fair. Uh, hey, how's it going, Daystra? Unfortunately, Adam could not be here tonight. Uh, we'll we'll hopefully try to get through his uh, his prelude next time. Uh, but we have. Oh. Oh, I forgot I was downloading something. That's a good thing I finished, because that would have fucked up the bandwidth. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know sounds are offline. I'm still... This is still a placeholder scene. I don't have the official mage one yet. Okay. Is there anything anybody wants to say before I just jump straight into this? Because I never really know how to segue. I'm so bad at this for being any kind of entertainer. Don't yeah. get crazy, y'all. Just think of how you segue your chapters together. Wait, do you, do you like my new book? Oh, you ordered a copy? Oh, you're amazing. Okay, okay, I have to remember to do that. Uh, my debut novel, Whitney of the Destroyer, is currently available on Amazon. If you're watching on YouTube, there's going to be a link down below. Uh, if you're listening on SoundCloud, also link down below. Oh, thank you, HG. You're awesome, too. What's up, Yorkie, buddy? Uh, yes, it is about uh, a knight during the Hundred Years' War and the cult of Apollyon spreading an apocalyptic plague. Uh, if you like World of Darkness, especially the Dark Ages stuff, I think you're going to dig it a whole hell of a lot. Uh, but in the meantime, let's tell an actual World of Darkness story. So, tonight I will begin with you, Tom. With Mr. Yanis Afluani. <laughs> Executioner, how's it going? So, Mr. Yanis, the date is May 4th, 58 BC, and you are a member of one of the Helveti tribes in Gaul. What do you think your life was like back then? Uh, let's see. You said 58 BC. Yes, sir. What happened that year? You're just like, gosh, it's so fucking sweet how we don't have any Roman occupation. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hate those Romans. Well, They'll I, never make it this far, though. Well, you're <laughs> not fully without care, for you see, the Helveti tribes have been, uh getting more and more pressure from tribes of northern barbarians. And there is talk of an evacuation happening. So I ask you once again, what sort of life did you lead? Were you a shepherd or maybe some sort of smith, a carpenter, a farmer? Probably did some farming somewhere along the line. Probably was... Probably was raised as a... F as a farmer hand, but probably fell into um, the assist, the ascendance and learning of, from a shaman. Interesting, interesting. Okay, and uh, so, what do you think your your tutelage under the shaman was like? You know, learning of the nature spirits. Um, how to appease them, praise them, so that we may have a bountiful harvest for the next 
Uh, what is it called? Season? The Harvest Moon. What is it called? Oh. Harvest Moon. Uh, the Equinox? Yes. Alright, and the shaman's name, what do you think his name was? I'll have to fucking come up with a fucking Helvati name? Shit. Uh, well, lucky for you, uh, I was looking up uh, Gaelic names earlier. Uh, so, we are going to go with Aiden. The shaman's name was Aiden. Oh, he's just... He's Aiden. <laughs> Eventually, the pressure from the northern barbarians becomes so great that you have no choice but to move your entire village... Uh, essentially up sticks. You've got to go, or you're just going to get raided and pillaged. So, to make sure that the migration couldn't be undone, the various tribes of the Helveti literally put their villages to the flame. They packed up their livestock, they packed up all of their earthly belongings, and they went... To the east, and the goal is uh, to seek shelter on the west coast of Italy. That's where you guys think you're gonna go. Um, so, what sort of family do you have? Uh, like I said, I was probably raised originally as a uh, farmhand by <laughs> by me pit pit pep. Um, though, if we also raised, um, animals, it's I'd buffering, like to think really? Was the one who, huh? Oh, no, HCG says it's buffering. Uh, it, stream looks solid on our end. So, I, I, I hope, if anybody else is getting that, definitely let me know. But as far as I can see, everything, everything should be square. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. I could think if we raised animals, it would, uh, it was actually my mother who took care of the um, the beast of burden, and that uh, it was actually a matriarchal house, which actually was fairly common in that uh, in that yep. culture, I believe. Yep. Okay. Uh, any brothers or sisters? Were you married? Uh, did you have any children? Hi, Melinda. Uh, Just go ahead and yank it. It's fine. Let's see, at that time, we probably had, like, a few brothers and sisters, maybe, uh, two brothers, one sister, no marriage, no children. Okay, so you are alone. Now, I've got some bad news for you. As you were traveling towards Italy, the, uh, original plan for your village, uh, took you across Transalpine Gaul, which, uh, was presided over by the Romans. And you oh, shit. very politely asked uh, Caesar's permission to traverse his uh, his area. What's up, Mr. Snurb? Uh, and they very that, politely man. told you no. So instead, your entire village, every man, woman, child, horse, cow, turned to the north with the intention of going around. But such was not to be. For you see, you awoke one morning to the sound of battle cries and the rolling clatter of chariot wheels and found that the Romans had pursued you over the border and now were attacking for what reason you don't know. Putting your encampment to the flames, your village scatters into the wilderness, into this this great vast expanse of forest and trees. As you look around, there is chaos all around you. You can see your brother, Angus, and uh, his wife. Come on, name. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. That's why. I literally wrote myself a table of contents just so I could do that. Your brother Angus and his wife, Aethna, who is struggling slightly as she is with child. 
You can hear the blades of the Romans being unsheathed and the Latin being uh, yelled behind you, echoing in the distance. What do you do? Fuck, I know what the Romans do to babies. <laughs> okay, so what what exactly is their surrounding look like? Is it like, are we in shri- like um, a forested area or you said alpine? So we were up in the mountains? Uh, right now you're... So you hit Alpine Gaul and were forced north. So it's a, maybe like a heavily wooded, lightly mountainous area. Lots of green, because I believe you're currently somewhere around the Rhone. At least that's where your tribe was originally from. But uh, this is a prelude, so you tell me what the surrounding is like. Okay, if we're near the Alpine, I like to think that it's probably we're at the base of the mountain. The base of the mountain. The mountains. So, I'm, yeah, I'm going with that. It's fairly wooded down there. Uh, I'm going to try... What was her name again? Uh, your brother's wife's name is Aethna. Aethna. I wanted to say Agatha. Which... I mean, we can change it if it's easier for you. It doesn't really matter. No. No, no, it's good. Eighth, no. What do you think, uh, what do you think she looks like to you? Huh. Well, of course, since we're... Since we're a kelt, we got, like, a... <laughs> she's got the, the crimson red hair. Okay, any other particular distinguishing features that she might have? Let's say a, a distinguishing birthmark on the back of her left hand. Okay, and what about your brother? Brother was more of a plain-looking dude, had br- brown hair, though built like an ox. Like a mountain of a man. He. Okay, but pretty, uh, pretty, pretty plain for the era. So, so it's yeah. like thick, dark hair, bushy beard. Yeah. All right, so the three of you are running for your life in this wooded, mountainous area. What, what do you want to do? I want to tell them that we need to find cover, perhaps in the mountains. Uh, uh, you, you see sort of Angus look back back towards them and up at the, the mountains as he runs towards Aethna's side. Uh, bro- brother, she's with child. Are, are you sure she can make it? Perhaps we don't need to climb the mountain. Perhaps we can find something. We can enter the mountain. Okay. As I start... <laughs> you start what? I was going to say, start doing a small chant for a rock or a spirit of the earth to help us find an entrance, into uh, a cave entrance, essentially. Okay. Um, doable, doable. So this is going to be sort of difficult for you because... Uh, most of the yeah. the magic that you've learned has been heavily ritualized, and you don't really have your ritual stuff with you. Uh, what spheres would you like to use to call out to a spirit of the earth? Uh, prime. Okay. Uh, there is a spirit sphere. Do you have any of that? I do not. <laughs> this is going to be very interesting. But yeah, I'll let you use prime. Uh, so go ahead and... Prime. Roll your arate. And I believe we're going to call this one a difficulty eight. A retain. I got one. One success. And three. Or no, I'm sorry. And two sevens. I've been there, buddy. Three. So you call out to the spirit of the earth, but you call out using prime. Um... And what happens is you begin to feel this sort of ground swell from beneath you. It feels 
warm, almost nurturing. And there is a very, very slight sound. It sounds like cracking. And it grows deeper and deeper by the moment. As you look at your feet, there's actually this very small fissure opening in the earth. And it trails its way around a pile of stones and up towards what might be a very, very slightly steep footpath towards the heart of the mountain. I'll call out to my brother, whose name I once and again cannot remember. Angus. <laughs> Angus. I'm, I'm saying Angus, but the, the spelling of this would piss you right the fuck off. <laughs> it's A-O-N-G-H-U-S. It's like Angus, but uh, I'm, I am I would feel weird saying Angus about a hundred times. Angus. And Eichna? Fuck. Eichna. I I found something. I found a place to hide. Uh Your brother looks dubious, but Aithna worried about her child and she's got she's not she doesn't exactly have a lot of quit in her. She's got quite a bit of spirit and fire. Uh, she rushes towards your direction. Your brother just sort of grits his teeth. I hope you know what you're doing, brother. Let's go to Friedrich, Friedrich Dominari. Yes. You're a young child at the moment. But you've always, always loved music. How did that that love spark? How did you become inspired? Inspired? Probably come from a, a family of classically trained musicians. But Ooh. it wasn't that was forced on him. So his mom played the cello and his dad played uh, the viola. And, and so, so he grew up in a musical household, but his uh, preferred instrument was always the uh, the guitar. So it started on a, a nylon classical acoustic guitar. Fantastic. Uh, so your your parents, being who they were, they hooked you up with probably one of the best, the absolute most prestigious music teachers in town. Uh, and this teacher comes with a certain pedigree. What what sort of person uh, do you think they were? I, I will say probably a a very strict German woman who believes in the like the the I think it was the Suzuki method and stuff like that of teaching just very strict repetitive kind of stuff and learning scales and being able to name all the points on the fretboard and the, and all the strings just by having them pointed at and stuff like that fantastic let's give her a name uh Agatha <laughs> you, do you really want an Agatha in the chronicle don't you <laughs> She sounds like an Agatha. Just saying. Uh, Tom can have his Agatha. Okay, Agatha. <laughs> now, Frau Agatha, she is, uh, uh, as I said, she comes with a pedigree, and she's used to a certain level of skill uh, from her students. So, how old do you think you are at this point? I think the average age to become a genius-level musician that you start is probably around six years old. Six years old. Let's say you're eight. Agatha's put you through your paces up till now, and you can, uh, she can point at frets and and chords, uh, she can show you sheet music like flashcards, and you know them. They're so burned into the back of your psyche. You eat, sleep, and breathe this shit. You review it before you go to bed, but you're sitting there and you're playing for Agatha, and something's not connecting. You know the notes, you know the chords, but when you try to place your fingers on them, they just won't go. They won't obey, and as you are sitting there trying to play, you can see Frau Agatha, her, her arms crossed, her face is just souring. And uh, what I would like for you to do is, uh, could I please have a perception? Um, 
I, it's always tough remembering which one. Let's go with Perception Empathy, please. Perception Empathy. Do you want me to roll fewer dice since I'm a child? Uh, how, well, what's your actual dice pool right now? Uh, right now it's a six. Six. Um, yeah, we'll say you've grown a little bit emotionally in, in, in a couple of years, so we'll, we'll cap your dice pool at four. Okay. Because you're still, you're still a genius. That would be three successes. Three successes. You look in this woman's eyes. And you not only... You can see, like, like the anger and the frustration, but there's something beneath that. It's disappointment. She's disappointed because she knows you know this. What do you do? My fingers aren't moving how I want them to, Frau Agatha. Your fingers. You're going to blame your fingers for this. I know you know these things, Friedrich. Look at your parents. Do you think your parents would sit there and blame their fingers? Do it again. I will try it again. Trying not to cry, probably. Uh, give me... Uh, let's go with a dexterity... What is performance in this? What did you put points into as performance? Oh, art. Okay, let's go dexterity art, and this is going to be a diff 10. And I think you know why. <laughs> Once again, do you want me to cap my dice pool? Uh, what's your dice pool? Or uh, you said dexterity art? That yeah. would be 8. Um, I'm going to say, at this point, as a small child, I'm, I'm going to give you 1 in art, and your dexterity is probably going to be 2. So you're going to roll 3 dice for this. Okay. Zero successes. Zero successes. It sounds like shit. Like, it, it, it is just the worst kind of dank, dank, plonk, dank, plonk. And how does that make Friedrich feel? He probably has burning tears coming down his face as he, despite knowing what he's, what he's trying to play, he's not getting it right no matter what he does. And so he's probably... An angry face, tears coming down his eyes as he's trying to pluck the guitar and his fingers aren't listening. And you just see Frau Agatha. Her face just... Her, her mouth becomes a thin white line. And she shakes her head and you can see in that movement there there's anger and... Just, just any kind of negative emotion that you can think. And she just spins on her heel and storms out of the room. She throws open the door and it swings, bam, behind her. And there's deafening silence in its wake. With only your last poorly plucked chord echoing to fill the silence. Alright. Uh, with that, we will move to Katrina. Now... Wait, before you start, I never learned how many dice or the amount of times I have to roll my one dice. Or... Okay, so the way it works that. is uh, when it's time for you to roll, I'm going to ask for an attribute plus ability. So if you're looking at your character sheet right now, your uh, attributes are the nine up top. These are your basic stats, right? Mm -hmm. And then abilities are the specific shit that you're good at. Uh, so I'll tell you... What attribute plus what ability, you count all of those dots, and then that's how many dice you're going to roll. Okay. And I will tell you what number you're looking for on the dice. Uh, ones, if you roll any ones, they will subtract successes. And uh, success is your target number. You get me? Okay. So, rolling, so if I say you're looking for six, right... And you roll three sixes, that's a better result than if you had rolled one six. We call those the number of successes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we also have a house rule. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of groups that don't use this rule. We started using this because the math behind the game is actually a little wonky. Uh, tens will negate ones. 
You get me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we'll practice it a couple times, so you shouldn't have an issue. I think that's one of the best house rules. Um, it is and it isn't, because it, it, it does fuck with a lot of things. For instance, Murphy Fierro, like, aced every fucking humanity roll, despite being Murphy <laughs> fucking Fierro. So, uh, there are times when the, the World of Darkness system, like, relies on you having a high chance of failure, and it's supposed to be risky. And the house rule neuters that, but I do think that in general, for nine rolls out of ten, it's probably pretty good. Okay. Uh, so, Katrina, you grew up on a farm in uh, rural Mexico. Tell me about this farm. Um, it's farther south, so it's very green, a lot of trees and grass. So like Oaxaca or is that am I am I still thinking too far north? Um I was just gonna go with what I know, so let's say Veracruz. Oh, you you know Mexico far better than I did. I was just <laughs> impressed that I knew Oaxaca and wanted to brag about it. So by all <laughs> means, let's do we we can do whatever the hell you say. Alright. We're with more exits, damn. <laughs> so yeah. We're going to Veracruz. Um, it's green. There's a lot of grass, a lot of animals, and um, a small area also for just like crops, but for the household. What sort of crops do you grow? Um, lots of leaves. Mango. Yeah, we have some mango trees, hey, some lime trees. Um, lots of leafy greens. Like a pasote, um, and all the common stuff. Uh, let's say guava. some sure guava, tomatoes, and a banana tree that hasn't given any bananas yet. So, uh, and it is a beautiful farm, but unfortunately, despite being in your family for generations, it's probably not made a lot of money, you know. Your, your parents and even your grandparents work on this farm every day, and it's you're, you guys are happy, and you have enough, but it's always just, just enough. And unfortunately, tragedy strikes one day. Uh, your grandfather had an accident. What sort of accident do you think he had? Um, he was out feeding the pigs and um, no he was out feeding chickens or taking eggs from chickens and then saw a snake trying to eat the the eggs um, and in, got startled and fell back and hit his head and what were you doing when that happened? Because you're you're probably a small child at this point. Yeah. How old do you think you were? I'm around at that point. Let's say five. Okay, you're five years old. Yeah. So I'm just running around after the chickens because I'm I'm with him. You're running around at the, after the chickens and. You, you, you hear your grandfather cry out, Dios mío! As he, as, and you hear this heavy thump. And things go quiet. And you run into the chicken coop. And you see your grandfather lying there. Bleeding from the corner of his head. What do you do? At first, I'm startled and I don't know what to do. But then I see... I like a watery version of my grandfather standing next to his body and I try to talk to him but he's just like looking at himself so your grandfather sort of stares down at his body you see the, this, this watery murky sort of version of him and he turns to you and there's this sort of fear in his eyes. And he says something. 
but no no sound comes out. It, you, you see his lips move, and because of the murky sort of distortion, you can't... You, you try to read, but you can't. Um, can you give me... Uh, I'm going to ask for a perception empathy roll from you. So how many dots do you have in perception? Three, and empathy also has three. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna roll six dice. Okay. You are you are a remarkably empathetic and perceptive six year old. Should I do what Josh did? And no, it's fine. It's that? fine. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna oppose <laughs> additional penalties on you. Josh has played a hundred times. You haven't. Uh, I'm I, I'm far rather you learn the dice system. Uh, so yeah, just okay. go ahead and roll the dice, and you're gonna be looking for eights for me. Eights. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's remember just one. The number eight, right? Like not eight or higher. No, it is eight or higher, yes. Oh, eight or higher. So eight, okay. nine, eight nines and tens will all count. Uh, ones will take away successes, and tens will take away ones. So just tell me how many successes you get. I got no successes. None whatsoever. So you have... But no ones. You have no idea what he's he's trying to say to you. What do you do? Um, I'm going to start crying and panic and um, try to try to grab him. Uh, as you race and try to grab your grandfather, your hands slide through him. It's icy cold, and he just sort of fades. And eventually your crying rouses your father... Uh, he comes running in from the fields. Uh, he calls to your mother and perhaps your siblings. And they bring your grandfather inside. They lay him in bed. They call a doctor. The doctor uh, comes. And of course, there's nothing that can be done. And you just see your, your, your old grandmother, your old shriveled grandmother. She stands there and she's got a... Uh, a handkerchief pressed to her lips. And she just sits there sobbing. Later that night, uh, you're in bed. And you can hear through the thin walls of the farmhouse that your, your mother's just crying. You're like, I, I, I don't know how to... What do you think your, your, your grandfather's name was? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Dios mío, how are we going to keep the farm without Jesus? And your your father, it's all right, Mama. I'll I'll, I'll work something out. I'll, I'll I'll get an extra job. Or, uh, and she says, "Mijo, you you already work enough for two people. If we don't figure out something, we're going to lose the farm, or we're going to be broke." And then, your father. Chaz, you're breaking my immersion by not speaking Spanish. You no, my Spanish would break your immersion further. <laughs> Believe me, Telemundo Spanish. <laughs> I know what you're referencing. Uh... I... <laughs> Later. Uh... <laughs> what do you think your room looks like as as a small five year old child? In a in a little farm. Uh -huh. It's gonna be pretty tiny. Um. Um, tiny bed, uh, a big, a big, um, what's it called, like a chest full of my toys that's painted with a bunch of random little things that I've put on there, and um, probably a little, like, fake kitchenette set thing, and stuffed animals. And uh, how is... How's Katrina reacting to sort of hearing hearing this? They, they they talk about this. They didn't want you to hear this. They don't know that you can hear, but you can hear. And you can hear the pain and the worry in your grandmother's voice. And you can hear your dad is, is trying to be strong, but you already know. You already know that your dad works like a dog. There's not much else he's going to be able to do. Um, I'm going to have my... Let's say I had a little alcancia. What's that called in English? Um, my little piggy bank. Uh -huh. And I'm just holding it, crying in a corner while I listen to them talk. 
Uh, roll roll one die for me. You're not we're not making a check here. I just want to see what number you get. Four. Four. There are four one peso coins clattering around in the bottom of your little piggy bank as you as you hold it and cry. And right next to the kitchenette, between the kitchenette and the door, your grandfather fades into appearance again. And he looks at you with this fear and this urgency in his eyes. And he says something again, but you can't make it out. Give me the perception empathy one more time. For an eight again? Yeah. Okay, that's one. That's two. Two. Two successes. Two successes. Ooh. Uh, so his mouth perhaps through sheer force of will is clearer to you this time and you can make out exactly two words uh, abuela and tree and then as you can see him like become slightly more animated as he tries to come closer to you uh, and speak more forcefully, if you will. Perhaps he's unaware that you can't actually hear him. Uh, but eventually he just fades again. And there's this, uh, there's this tiny voice from your corner of the room that says, I can see him too, you know. Oh, you just give me chills. I don't like that. What do you do? Okay. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna turn, try to find that tiny voice, but probably also run to the other side of the room. Okay. So you run, you run to the other side of the room, uh, and from behind your toy chest, this tiny little claw wraps around the corner, and you see uh, these two thin little horns and these big ears and this big set of googly eyes poke out and says please don't be afraid I, I won't hurt you um so I'll, I'll get close try to talk to it I guess ask ask what their name is uh so you tell me this is your alebrije oh oh um oh cute I didn't, I didn't prepare a name for it. I didn't think about that. Kiki. Yeah, Kiki. <laughs> you like Kiki the Alabrije? <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of Kiki's delivery service. Yeah. <laughs> but also definitely like a name a child would give something. And then, so Kiki, uh, after after it gets over its own shyness, it, it comes and it waddles out from behind the toy chest. And it just kind of sits in front of you and it says, I think, I think your abuelo's trying to talk to you. But you can't hear him, can you? Nope. No, all I heard was something about a tree and my grandmother. And sort of like looks up at you with, with these these wide hopeful eyes and says, "Maybe I can help." I'm gonna ask if he can hear my grandfather. No, I can't hear him either. But there's ways. What what ways? And as you say that, we fade out and we go to Kedik. Kedik, let's talk about your childhood. All right. How do you how do you think Kedek grew up? So you are a, a nature loving freedom fighter. What was the forma formative years for that? Um. Oh man. Okay. So it, it it's probably going to be m pretty modern. Um. <clears throat> but probably just a lot of time out spent running around in nature. Um. You know, camping, hiking, just the that that whole nine yards. 
and, and definitely had a, a fondness for like sketching, pressing flowers, like like just anything that he could kind of observe that he thought was beautiful. He wanted to kind of like put that down because it was sort of just a, a continuing inspiration for it. Okay. Somebody in your in your family or perhaps an authority figure they didn't like that very much. They thought you were wasting your time. Tell me about that person. Um Probably had a really nosy aunt. That that oh, just Oh, I immediately know the type. Aunt fucking Karen. Yeah. Like like just kind of but like he's just wasting his time just running around having all this like like you know stupid sketchbook always wanting like just messing around with toys and running around looking at animals like not actually doing anything useful or like learning anything interesting um too much of a free spirit i guess so one day you're sitting in your backyard uh your aunt has come to visit your father's at work uh, and your mother, uh, might, maybe it's her day off, maybe she's a stay-at-home mom, it's up to you. Uh, she's entertaining your aunt on the porch while you're going through the bushes, and you found the coolest fucking caterpillar you've ever seen in your life. And you're sitting there with your sketchbook, and you're sketching it. And your mom goes into the house to fetch more lemonade. And it's just you and your aunt in the backyard, and you can feel, like, her prying eyes burning into your shoulder as you're trying to sketch this caterpillar. How do you feel? Uh, Honestly, at this point, he, he's... Like, I imagine he's probably, like, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Preteen age. And he's he's dealt with it for so long, he just almost doesn't even care anymore. It's like, yeah, this lady's glaring at me, but, like, she's always glaring at me. Why don't you give me a uh, did? Why don't you give me a dexterity art? I'm assuming you're like Josh and you put you you did art for your uh, your graphic design. I did. All right. Yes. Go ahead and give me dex art. Uh, I'll, I'll subtract two dice from your dice pool since you're a little bit younger. Okay. Uh, what number am I looking for? Um, seven. Two successes. Two successes. Okay, so... It's a reasonable facsimile, right? Like, it kind of looks like the caterpillar, but the lines aren't as straight as you might like. And it's, you know, it's got kind of a weird fat head and a skinny little ass. Uh, yeah, but, it, I mean, it's, it's probably really lacking because it needs color to really make it really look what like what this caterpillar needs to look like. It's currently just in black and white. So you are sitting there in the backyard and you're trying to avoid your aunt's gaze and your mom comes back with a pitcher of lemonade. And as she sits down, uh, what do you think your mother's name is? Agatha. <laughs> oh, uh, my oh, mother's name is Martha, name too. Is Agatha. <laughs> your Aunt Karen sort of leans in and under her breath... Or, or Greta. We'll call her Greta. Greta? Okay. Uh, really, Greta, don't you think the boy should be up to something more useful at his age? And your mother says, I don't think there's any harm in it. He's just enjoying himself. Exactly. When I was his age, I... You remember mother had us running to ballet recitals and violin lessons. And look at him. The boy... The boy just sits and draws insects. Are we certain he's not... Special needs? He's not special needs, Karen. He's just... Curious about certain things. Yes, well, we'll see that curious where the curiosity ends him when he grows up. Look at him. What, what sort of job can you get drawing insects? As if the Encyclopedia Britannica will just hire some child in his backyard. And how do you how do you feel sort of overhearing this? Um, he he probably is gonna take. A little bit from it like if he is gonna do something with his art he would need to do it in a way that it can be spread faster 
and that he he I, I guess it almost kind of like builds that free spirit since he he de- he feels like he can't always rely so heavily on his family because of some of the people that are in it. He's like, I need to be able to find a way to be able to make this happen and spread it in my own way. Cool. So you're about 10 or 11, and this is early days yet at the beginning of the internet. What's your right. idea? Um, he He's probably messed around on, like, like he, his family definitely has, like, a computer or two. And he's probably, like, messed around with, like, some of the little, like, crappy programs on there. And it's like, if only I had access to something better, this this could be something. But as of right now, he I think he's... He probably spends more of his time just really trying to understand his, I guess, craft in a sense. And, and like, really looking for the things that he finds, like... Like, he likes drawing bugs and plants and stuff, but he wants something with a little more fervor, something more inspiring than just something that's pretty to look at. All right. And does that... What does that feel like to him? Is it, like, a driving force... Is it a deep-seated hunger, a void looking to be filled? Uh, is it something that he keeps an eye out for as he grows, or is it something it's, he actively goes looking for? It would probably be more, at this age, something he's more, like, trying to keep an eye out for, because, like, he doesn't really know what all is out there. He just knows kind of what's in his own, like, little world, you know, like the world of, like, a, an 11-year-old. And so he he's focused much more on just I'm going to do what I can here and just keep looking for another outlet. Okay, interesting. So what does he do? Um in this moment or uh you tell me. This is a prelude, so you're you sort of have the driving the driving wheel right now. Um, well, I, I imagine, like, when, when he gets into, like, his teenage years is probably when he actually really f- starts understanding, like, there are much better resources and things. Because, like, like I said, it's this, he, he's a much more modern age sort of person. Uh-huh. Um, so, like, he, he probably would find his way to, like, pirate a like a version of photoshop or illustrator or something like and and just really start playing around with that because it's like part of him doesn't trust his aunt and maybe some of those people on that side of the family to like not fuck with his shit whereas like on a on a computer like he can put passwords on it he can save things email stuff to himself like he can put his art on the internet and they can't touch it anymore Interesting. Uh, why don't we go with uh, intelligence computers, please? Okay. Any dice pull hindrance? Uh, you're getting older now. I'm not going to worry too much about it. We'll call this a dipstick. Okay. Uh, two successes. Two successes. Um, does he have a GeoCities? No, I think at this age was DVR just started probably coming out, but he's, he's he's definitely got one of those. Yeah, he 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 is definitely on the G, the DVR side of things. Now, as uh, as social media has become more and more popular, uh, Kedic has a MySpace because it's it's like two thousand six. Yeah. And of course he's followed his family and your mother made you friend your aunt. And you see her start posting all of these uh well it's definitely Alex Jones stuff and this uh Bilderberg conspiracy and how uh they're using global warming as a false flag to uh d- distract from there, I'm, I'm trying real hard to fucking channel all my conspiracy, uh, bullshit nonsense. Uh, trying to distract from the new world order and the, the globalism.
How does that make no, you the freaking feel? frog's gay. I mean, he's he's dealt with this crazy side of the family for so long. Like he he's just not even phased by it. He's like, oh yeah, here we go again, fucking crazy Karen, doing more shit again. Um, he probably has his own like secondary MySpace page, like under a different name, and he'll he will draw up like these like posts that look super fucking accurate like like they came from an actual website kind of shit of like counter fact check shit and just plop them on her page and stuff so she has no idea who it is but like he loves watching her fume at this person who keeps like debunking anything she ever posts Fantastic! You know she goes on these epic fucking tirades for pages and pages and pages uh, and calls you a sheep and uh, tells you to open your eyes and you sit back and laugh at every minute of it. And as we, as the as the camera fades out on Kedek leaning back in his computer chair, we will go from a very modern person to a very unmodern person as we uh, as we flip back to Yanis. Yanis, I don't know what you mean. Who's not modern? Uh, you see the tiny fissure sort of run and thread its way to the earth. And in the distance, on the wind, you hear a voice. And it says, Yannis. I look back. Like what you calling out to the... uh, your brother and his his huffing puffing wife? They they sort of look up at you like it's the first time they've noticed you, as he's just helping his wife up the mountain. What you say something? Uh, no, brother. I I wouldn't dare. They're, they they but could be right behind us. Could have sworn I heard my name being said. Yeah, wasn't I? And he he sort of just helps Ethna uh, past you, and as you round the corner, you <clears throat> there is this large cave, sort of cut into the side of the mountain, and there is light streaming from it. Now, See. the oh, light, what? this looks very strange to you. You've never seen light coming out of a cave. Your brother and sister-in-law don't seem to notice it. Hmm. You see, up there, that's, that's where we need to go. That's how we get to safety. Through, through the cave, are you sure, brother? Yes, we have to go towards the light. That was... The, the light? Ooh, what light? It's dark as pitch in there. <laughs> the... How do you not... How do you not see it? It's up... It's right there. As I point with my finger. Uh, so, you you see your brother. Uh, he's he he cocks his eyebrows and he's like, "Brother, are you are you feeling well?" And Aethna standing next to him, one hand on her stomach, the other on her back, huffing and puffing. She looks up at the cave and says, "No, no, I think he's right. We should go." And without another word, she begins making her own way towards the mouth of the cave. Woman, what are you, crazy? As he goes scrambling after. Well, we only one way to go. It's either be either into the cave or either to the sphere. As I go along too. As you enter the cave, the light 
seems to dim and just fade to blackness. But again, echoing from the depths of the cave, you can hear, Yanis. And that word seems to mutate and change as it floats through the air, uh, seething from one voice to another mid-word, uh, from the deep voice of a man to the high voice of a child to the low seductive voice of a woman to something entirely unhuman. And then it fades. And there is silence. There is the echo of a drip. There is the chitter of a bat. And darkness. So let's conclude with God now. Uh, yes, by the time you cross the threshold of the cave, you couldn't see anything anymore. I don't suppose we have anything to make us make any porches with. You tell me, ba 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 da ba. Pow! This is prelude, man. You're the boss. I'm just I'm I'm along for the ride. This is an important note uh, on a next time. Next time it'll be a more traditional role-playing experience. For now, we're just doing the prologue. Spoiler alert, he wins. Ha <laughs> ha. I cannot die. Here. <laughs> you can't die yet. That means you can literally do anything in the prologue. And you will survive. Yeah. But do not be surprised when it comes back in the main story. The only wad game where you can die during character creation? I don't know if that's true. I'm pretty sure Adam could figure it out on a whole lot of systems. Um, are we really going to not point out Wraith? Yeah, with Wraith, you have to die in the prologue. <laughs> you know, fair point. I didn't think of that. Technically... No, no. Even if you're arisen, you still have to die. I was gonna say, vampire, you die at the end of the at the end of the the prelude. That too. Two, two of these games require you to die at the beginning. Mummy. I guess three of them. <laughs> Jesus. Remember mummy. Yeah. Oh, demon. Demon also kills you before session one. Oh. <laughs> I guess it's more normal for a prelude to have you die at the beginning than to not have you die. <laughs> Although in Demon, isn't it technically you're taking over the body of someone you killed? Yes, and... Well, no, no, no. You didn't kill them. They happened to die. And you, Demon, being an opportunist, was like, yoink, not going back to hell, and now you're both people. <laughs> but also the soul of the other person gets sent to hell in your place. Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, probably, no, I'm going to probably say we do not have, we did not have the chance to make torchlight, so we're having to tra traverse this as best as we can. Though, brother, I'll go up ahead to make sure that the path is clear, at least for you and Ikta. <laughs> I Aithna stands up and says, No, I'm going too. And uh, Angus looks at her like again like she's crazy. Woman, you're in no position to go into some dark cave. You could fall and trip and, and kill both of you. And Aithna sort of looks at you. And uh, she gives you this sort of like quizzical look. Can I get a perception empathy from you? Perception empathy? Ooh. What's the difficulty? Six. I got one success. One success. You think she's looking at you like you're crazy. 
And then suddenly it begins to dawn on you that, no, maybe you're not the only one that feels something from this cave. And you begin to read the look on her face almost as a, do you feel it too? Okay, I have no... And brother, brother whose name I can't remember. <laughs> he's Angus. the one. He, Angus. He's the one with the Angus. normal name. Right, Angus. Angus State. Got it. <laughs> we'll go in. Fi- we'll go in single fire line, and I'll be in front. At the very least, but we'll go together. Because that. Because I think we both understand that this is our salvation. Aethna looks at you. I hope so. All right. Just stay behind. So you join hands and you begin to venture into the cave. Ah, Friedrich. Friedrich Dominari. It is years later. You have obviously kept to the craft and you've practiced... It has gotten better, but has got not gotten easier. Do you think Friedrich really knows what's wrong with him yet, or is he still trying to like brute force it? I I think he he feels something isn't normal. Like but he hasn't. He, sometimes he's probably like writing, and then he just drops the pencil without thinking and stuff like that. And he's worried there's something not normal with him. Yeah but he doesn't want to admit that there's something wrong. And so he probably just tries to, to cover it up by saying he was like uh, his mind was somewhere else or something like that. All right, but he, so he definitely doesn't have a medical diagnosis yet. Yeah. All right. So your band is playing a gig. Uh, so what's the name of the band? This may or may not be your permanent band. That's up to you. And uh, where are you playing? I right now I'm assuming he's not a native El Pasoan, but uh, I don't know. We'll say a, a musical town, so we'll go with Austin. So he's probably playing. Uh, do you remember what street it is on A where all the the the, the music clubs are? I don't. All the music clubs. There's there's one street on Austin, literally, that's almost nothing but music venues. So he's probably playing at one of the smaller ones on like a Friday night. And uh, Sixth Street. I'll, I'll, what's Seven? up? Sixth, Sixth Street. Yeah, it is Sixth Street. It's been a while since I've been. But his band, I. He's probably playing. Uh, It's probably more like uh, Animals as Leaders, Polyphia kind of pure prog instrumental stuff. So his first band name, or at least the first one he's playing with right now, is going to be... The problem is, if I think of one off the top of my head, I might just be saying a smaller band I, I haven't listened <laughs> to in a while. Isn't that a bastard? That happens to me when I try to come up with fantasy names. And then fucking, like, seven years later, I will find out that it was, like, a throwaway line in some RPG book I flipped through once. You want Tom to name your band? If he has a good one, I'll go with it. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, I could imagine... If you could have Animals as Leaders as a band name, who I actually... I got to see live play. That was interesting. Uh... But if you could have, like, animals as leaders, like, I think Agatha would make a perfectly fine band name. His band name for right now, it's uh, Fractals. Fractals, that's fucking great. Also a fantastic song by uh, Itvara. <laughs> I, I, was, I was trying to think of something, what some, I was like, something that sounds like a progressive metal band would name themselves, but also something that probably some weirdo things has to do with the sacred geometry or something. Now I'm gonna have to look up if that's a real band name. 
I'm but sure yes, there's somebody the named Fractals, but I mean, you're you're a, a like a, a small band playing in Austin. Like, there's gonna be overlap, especially if it's Fractal one word. Square. What, what was that, Kyle? Fractal Square. No. <laughs> well, it looks like there is a technical metal band from the UK called Fractals, but I'm in the US, so doesn't count. Yeah. So you're playing, and I'm going to give you your full dice pool this time. Give me, give me dexterity art. Uh, you still don't really have a medical diagnosis yet. We're going to call this a diff nine because you're still really not sure what's wrong with you. You're still trying to push through it. Difficulty nine. Yeah. Whose successes? Well, actually, technically, with my specialty, that counts as three. Okay. Cool. Um. You are doing okay, but just okay, right? It's perfectly passable. And with the, the the drunks in the audience don't seem to notice, but you do. How do you feel? Are you trying to ignore it? Do you acknowledge it? I think by trying, he's he's trying to cover up the, the flubs in the music by trying to make it seem like it's little bits of improvisation. Okay, fair enough. As you're playing, you look up, and there's a woman standing next to the bar. Uh, she's dressed in a black pantsuit. She definitely does not look like the type of person that would ever be at this bar. You have no idea why she's here, but hey, you know, everybody's got a hobby. Maybe this is what she does to unwind after work. And she looks like she's maybe in her late 30s. Uh, hair sort of tied back in this tight bun, square glasses. And she's just staring daggers at you. <laughs> like really intense daggers. Do you interpret that as being part of the performance? Or you think maybe she has some kind of other problem? I don't know what her problem is, but I'm I'm gonna try to I'm, as I see her anger, I'm gonna channel it into the music as well, as as uh, Friedrich probably looks right at her in her eyes as he as he starts uh, he's he's gonna basically mess with his pedals on the floorboard a little bit and basically make the sound come out a little heavier, a little crunchier Fantastic. as he switches from like the 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 more. Uh, the more clean leads into like more crunchy, heavy tones and stuff like that. Ooh, Kyle, does your cup have a K for Kyle on it? Yes. <laughs> it was given to me. If that makes you feel any better. I, I, it would have made me feel better if you bought it for yourself. <laughs> for Kedek, I guess. <laughs> or every other character that I play that their name starts with a K. So. You're getting to the bridge, and you start going into this really epic solo. Like, you've poured your heart and soul in this. You've worked on this for months. This is the crowd pleaser. This is what's going to kill it. You start feeling that smugness welling up inside you, because you know you're going to show this bitch, right? And your arm almost begins to shut down as you do it. It doesn't stop moving, but it won't obey you try to do a hammer on and it's a fret too low or you pull your pull off is a fret too high or you accidentally strike three other strings uh as you try to lay down and it's getting worse and worse and progressively worse and the other band members are beginning to notice their eyes flash up and look at you with this this look in their eyes what the hell are you doing I'm I'm with my with I'm assuming it's my fretting hand giving out then. And as I as as he realizes that his body is just completely not listening to him and he knows it's not like a matter of skill, he he basically turns all the knobs on the guitar the way up as he hits the distortion pedal and makes it as loud as he can and just scrapes the pick along the strings and then basically with his good arm grabs it the neck and smashes it against one of the amplifiers oof 
So that takes everybody by surprise. Uh, your band members sort of leap back and recoil. Uh, the audience is dumbstruck at this point. There's this hush that falls over. Your eyes go to the woman. And for a second you think you're going blind too because she looks completely different. The pantsuit is gone. And you see that she's wearing these long oh. red flowing robes. And her these she has these long tresses of blonde hair cascading down, but you sort of like do a double take. And when you look again, it's the woman in the pantsuit again. And she doesn't really seem to react at all. Her sneer deepens, if anything. But your band is not pleased at the moment. You just destroyed expensive equipment. Uh, the lead singer just puts his hand on the microphone. What the hell, man? I, I very angrily, I'm going to kind of take the mic from him. I'm going to be like, that's rock and fucking roll as I smash it on the floor and walk <laughs> off. You're a jazz band. <laughs> He's like, I thought this was a jazz metal fusion project. Jazz metal fusion. Pro I'm curious now. <laughs> so you're alone after the performance, probably still in the vicinity of the club. Explain the scene to me. Tell me what's going on and what's going through your head. I'm, I'm going to assume he's not old enough to drink at this point, but he was allowed into the club as a performer. So he, he probably has like a, a Dr. Pepper sitting at the... Uh, nice. At the end of the mosquito, uh, definitely yeah. in Texas. At the at the end of the bar, and it has like a cherry in it, so it looks like a Jack and Coke. As he's he's trying to do like his uh his hand exercises with his with his bad hand, well, it it just kind of shakes very stiffly. And as you sort of do that, there's a presence behind you as you turn to see who it is it's the woman in the pantsuit and she sort of looks you up and down and says well <laughs> kind of hand in, head in his hand he kind of looks over at her and he says I don't know what record label you're the a and r for but uh i think that was the last show i don't it, think fractals is gonna keep going is that supposed to be funny are you really going to sit there and pretend you don't recognize me that you don't remember what you did Just kind of looking at her, squinting at her in disbelief. If this is your club. I'm sorry. If I ruined your night. But I got bigger things to worry about right now. She sort of leans in, and you can see her anger deepening. I am your biggest worry. Let's see if I can jog your memory until you're ready to apologize. And you see her eyes flash. Literally flash. And as she does so, the red robes come back, the long blonde tresses come back, and there are literally fucking colors flowing out of her in almost an aura. And what few people are still in the bar, the bartender, nobody else seems to see this. But as your eyes are glancing around, there's some Cthulhu shit happening right before you. Until you are ready to apologize, until you are ready to admit what you have done to me and make amends, then you will suffer as all my people do. Uh, do you want do you want the rhyme I wrote, Chaz? Please do. Uh, the, the the curse I came up with is uh, see. Uh, you never... look, look, hang on, hang on, hang on. I look at this is fucking why Josh is awesome. He wrote his own fucking curse, dude. D yes, give I... me that rhyme. I, I came up with, may you never rest your bones upon the same set of stones, and may the fairy's bane be also your decay. It 
See, if you had told me you were written a rhyme, I could have used that. Uh, you're, you're welcome to say it with more gravitas than I just did. Oh, no, I would not. Uh, that seems cringy. <laughs> hey, uh, no we at. How's it going? Boys. Uh, so, may you never rest your bones upon the same set of stones. And what was the other one? May the fairies bane? Be also Which your decay. Which cat is that on, I.E.? She was, she was very upset, so she had to go with the slant rhyme for the second one. It's He's it's being very spicy, so... Nice. It's that time of night. Uh, and so... That sort of echoes through your mind and all of a sudden she's gone the the robes the the tr long tresses the colors she's just not there and nobody seems to notice but you begin to smell burning flesh and as you look down there's a strip of metal in the bar and you pull your hand away from it as it feels like it's literally on fire and almost sort of stumble off the, off the stool. He's probably just going, what the fuck is going on tonight? Alright. Back to Katrina. And Anna E. Uh, so, do you attempt to communicate with your grandfather that night? Or do you wait until morning? I'm going to do it that night. That night, okay. So you wait for everybody to go to sleep, and finally silence falls over the house, and it is dark. And the door to your bedroom creaks open. As you see the big bulbous eyes of Kiki the Alabrije lean out, and then yours, you sort of creep around the corner. You can hear your father snoring fitfully, in the room down the hall. You can hear your uh, abuela sort of sigh in her sleep. What do you do? Um, I'm going to try to sneak into my abuela's room and um, try to like grab something that smells like my grandfather to make me feel better. Cool. Uh, so let's go with a dexterity. Is it stealth in this one? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, dexterity stealth, please. Difficulty six. Yeah, Ani, there will inevitably come a time where I ask you to roll a stat that is not on your sheet because all of these games are very slightly different and we get them confused. Okay, so I got if it's one. if it's not on your sheet, just tell me. Okay, one. Okay. Um, so you sort of sidle into your uh, abuela's room, and what do you, what do you, what does it look like? I'm assuming uh, there's probably like a pretty large crucifix and that big picture of Jesus. My yes, of course, of a white Jesus. Um, really, white Jesus in Veracruz? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Michelangelo's gay lover. He's everywhere. or no Leonardo da Vinci's gay lover. Why Jesus is everywhere. Um, anyway. She has like a little... What's it called? The... The furniture with the big mirror on top and... Oh! Uh, a vanity? Yeah, yeah. She has a vanity with like a crocheted um, little topper. Bunch of little pillows. And it's just a lot of wood. Like everything, like the, the walls are wood, and anything in there is made out of wood. Okay. You sneak in there, and your grandmother is obviously very wiped out, and the, the grief has taken a lot out of her, so she, uh, she is very soundly asleep. Okay, um, I'm going to grab like uh, the one of his handkerchiefs from 
from his little drawers and, and run out. Okay. So you pick up the handkerchief. What does it look like? Is it sort of like, uh, does it have that paisley print on it? or? Uh... Yeah, that is like old and worn out. But it, it smells nice and clean and it's ironed. It smells like his cologne. Mm-hmm. It's just a perfect square. Okay, so you grab it, you run out, and Kiki sort of whispers, what are we going to do with that? Now I'm going to tell Kiki that I, I just want it because it reminds me of him, and I'm hoping it's going to help me talk to him. Okay. Well, actually, it might. I mean, you know your grandpa better than I do. How do you think you can talk to him? Um, he was mentioning a tree, so I'm going to assume it's one of the older trees outside that they like to eat underneath, like have little picnics underneath. So I'm going to go over there and see if, if maybe he's waiting for me. Okay. Uh, so you run to the back door and you sort of poke your head out, uh, and it's a very clear night. There's no clouds, and the full moon is very bright. Uh, You do not see your grandfather under the tree. And Kiki sort of, like, crawls up onto the windowsill and looks out. You might have to call him. Is there anything else that was important to your grandfather? Uh, I'm going to try to go back in and see if I can find one of his watches or his... Let's say he has, like, a little pocket watch. Okay. Done deal. No roll. You can you can absolutely do that. Anything okay. else that you want to grab? Mm. Yeah, he has a... I have no idea what these are called in English, but they're, like, these little... It's a necklace that on both sides has a little saint mark. They You, you always wear it so you can... I think that I think it's supposed to be like you have to wear it, so the day you die, you're wearing it. You make sure you go to heaven. It's something like that. Oh, yeah. Seems like that should have been on the body. Yeah. So well, but but they're gonna they're gonna take it off. Okay. Yeah. So you've got his little saint necklace. Uh, saint Jude? Which which saint do you think he would wear? I don't know. I don't know the saints. The uh, just go with the one everybody else uses. The what's the patron saint of lost things? You asked me this like two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it sits neither here nor there. So you grab his, uh, you have his handkerchief. You have saint this. Anthony. Yeah. You have the 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 saint coin, and you have uh, his pocket watch. Um, okay, so then with, with my little things in hand, I'm, I'm going to try to go to the tree and, and yell out for him. Okay. And how, how, what, what do you say? Was there ever any, like, special, special thing that you had with your grandfather? Maybe, like, a special nickname or a special, uh, you know way you would converse, a nursery rhyme, a story he would read to you, anything that you two held in common. I'm, I'm going to call him Papa Juan. That was his name, right? Yeah. You said Jesus. Oh, Papa Jesus. But maybe he's uh, Jesus Juan de Dominguez <laughs> de Veracruz. I don't... No, 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 I'll just say Papa Jesus. Um... And just, I guess, just ask where he is. Yeah. You call out, and you look around, and there is silence. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Maybe go inside and try, try, like where I saw him last and try to call out for him. Okay. 
You call out for him the second time. There's still silence. How is it beginning to make you feel? I'm, I'm going to start crying. And, and... And just like holding his things to my chest. What do you think is the emotion that most drives Katrina in, in the future to uh, assist the dead? Is it... Uh, well, you tell me. What, what do you? What, what is the core of that de- that drive, that desire? The core would be, I guess, how things are going to make sure they don't feel like helpless. You don't have to. You don't have to base it off of this. I'm okay. asking your character. What What do you think drives Katrina? Yeah. So I'm. I'm. I'm trying to make sure people don't feel helpless, and trying to make sure they. Uh, they know there's always somebody there to help, even if it's not me. Okay, I like that. So right now, maybe Katrina's feeling a little bit helpless. Maybe she just wants Grandpa to to know that you're there to help. And you're, you're thinking about your grandmother and your father. And as these emotions start welling up, uh, and you're holding on to these items, you've got the pocket watch, and you've got the saint coin, uh, and you've got the, the handkerchief. I would like you to roll your arate, and we're gonna what? call we're gonna call this difficulty five. Okay, so then that's as many time as many little circles I have for that, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, one success. One success. Uh, as you sit there and, and you cry, you feel the faintest touch on your shoulder. And there's this whisper almost far off. And it says, Mejita, it, it's okay. You said I felt something on my shoulder, right? Yeah, the faintest little little touch as he rested a hand on your shoulder. It's very okay, light. I'm, I'm going to turn around and try to hug him again. I don't think that's going to work. Um, you hug him, and it doesn't quite feel like you're hugging him. It's more like the platonic ideal of the shape of him. But in that moment for you, it's close enough. I, I'm going to ask him what he was trying to say before. Since I can hear him now. And he sort of bends down, and he's a little bit clearer now. And he says... Uh, you, you see him smile, and there's this little tear in the corner of his eye. And he says... You know... When we first got married... Abuela and I, we would come out here, and we would eat lunch every day. And we would... Uh, we would sit and we'd listen to the birds and we'd talk about the future and when we'd have children and grandchildren just like you and I promised her, I promised her no matter what happened I'd always take care of her. I promised her that right here. I, um, I'm, I'm going to ask him where he where he's going, what happened and where he's going. And tell him that everybody's worried about the farm now. I don't know where I'm going, Mejia. I... Things are... Different now. The land doesn't look the same. The... People, strange people that want me to go to different places. I, I, I'm not sure yet, but... That's not what's important. I need you to know I promised your grandmother that she would always be taken care of. And he points at the tree, at the roots of the tree, and says, right here. And then he begins to fade again. Is there something in the tree? I don't know. You tell me. Well, I'm trying. I want to ask him. Or is he gone yet? He he has disappeared. 
But the last thing he did was he pointed towards the roots of the tree, towards a specific spot, and said, right there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to see if I can, like, dig something out with my little hands, with my little baby hands. All right. Uh, so your little baby hands, you sit there in the dirt and you begin pawing at it, and you're pulling it away, and it's it's a little bit difficult because the area is just overgrown with these really tough roots. Uh, but Kiki will sort of jump in and try and help you gnaw them away and pull them out. And. Hey. Uh, eventually, as you brush away the dirt, there is this little metal cigar box sitting in the hole that you've uncovered. Okay. Are, are you gonna... Do you know what's in the cigar box, or am I making this up? I know it's in the cigar box. Oh, okay, okay. I'm gonna grab it and, and take it to my grandma and wake her up. Uh, Katrina, what, what, what time is it, Miha? That I I don't know, but I I was I saw something outside and I found this. You see her eyes get really big as she flicks on the light. These are the cigar. These are the cigars that Willow used to smoke. And as she opens it, you see this, this, almost the color drains out of her face. Dios mio, as she looks through and there's these just stacks of papers. There's like war bonds and there is uh, like railway shares. And you, you as a small child wouldn't recognize it. Uh, but the stuff in this tiny little tin is worth tens of thousands of dollars by now. And she just sort of sets it on the on the the end table by her bed, and just tears pouring down her eyes. She lifts you up with what little strength her aged arms can muster, and she squeezes you against her chest. God is looking out for us, Mejia. God takes care of us. I mean, I'm a little baby. I don't know. I'm just gonna be crying. I don't know what it all means. All right, back to Kedek. Kedek, you have grown older. You have gotten out from the thumb of your aunt. And you've had more of a taste of freedom. Lately, it has been that you've... Uh, taken more of an interest in nature. You've been hiking lately, uh, going out further and further afield. What sort of drives that aspect of you? Um, <clears throat> I, I would imagine he's probably dabbled more into a bit of his activism, and so like this, this is kind of the stuff that he views as worth saving like kind of the planet nature <laughs> that whole deal but also like he, he goes out there for inspiration and just solitude like getting away from his family or at least like the shittier half of his family is it's sort of one of those things that i think really drives him to spend a lot of time out here also i don't know physical health fun so you've parked your car probably just off of trans mountain somewhere and you're hiking through the mountains, and you reach the top of a peak, and uh, you look out at this beautiful scenery before you, the, the, the scenic view of all these vistas sprawling out before you, and it's probably during the rainy season, so there's some lush green everywhere, and you see like the, the shimmer of a bush as perhaps some sort of rabbit uh, disappears past it. And how does that make you feel? Oh, he, he's he's probably ecstatic. Like he, he's almost certainly out here because it's been raining, and he knows everything is like blooming and growing like crazy up here on the mountainside. Um, so he probably s wants to see if he can't kind of follow along. Um, 
See if you can't spot this rabbit, like, perch up on a rock somewhere. Okay. So I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want... Would you rather roll Dex Stealth or Perception Awareness? Uh... I'll go with Dex Stealth. I think I have a slightly better chance. Uh, what am I looking for? Uh, it is a fucking rabbit, so let's say seven. I feel like seven's fairly... Uh, uh, it's a fairly even ask. One success. One success. Alright, so you hunker down low when you're moving through the brush. And you start getting close to this rabbit, and right when you're about ten feet away, it turns to you and bolts! What do you do? Fuzzy, fuzzy little shit. I, I I'm just gonna let him go. Like I, I don't I don't need to spook him more than I already have. Plus, you know, I've seen rabbits. Uh, I'll probably just like continue on my hike, like just kind of looking for for trails and or, or, or maybe even just bushwhacking, seeing if I can't like find ways into areas that I haven't been to on the mountainside. Okay. Uh, you do find such a trail and you're as you're sort of navigating it there's this deep guttural boom that sort of peels out over the sky and as you look up there are clouds beginning to gather you've been so enamored in nature that you haven't noticed the storm gathering and it looks like it's about to like let go at any moment what would you like to do? Um, <clears throat> I'm probably going to try and backtrack, but also, like, kind of come down away from the the crest of the ridges that I'm at, just so I'm not, like, the highest point on the side of this mountain. Makes but, sense. Know, middle, middle of the desert. It's not exactly a lot of tall vegetation out here. Okay. Um, let's... Give me Wits Survival. What am I looking for? Eight. Two successes. Two successes, okay. Uh... So, you begin to descend the mountain a little bit. But the sun gets blotted out by clouds and eventually the rain starts coming down and the ground is slick and you're able to hold your way and you start sort of going back the way you came you think but this area is an area you haven't explored before and it's beginning to get dark and all of a sudden you slip you slide you go tumbling down the mountain and i'd like you to roll stamina please to soak Uh, nope. Okay, so you're going down, you're getting banged up, you, you conk your head a good one, and you bash your shoulder, uh, and you finally come to a stop covered in mud and dirt, uh, and you, you can taste blood in your mouth. That was a, that was a full-on botch. <laughs> and as you look up, the world becomes a just bright spray of light. And you only have a split second to notice there's a bolt of lightning coming directly towards you. I mean, I... He would try to reflexively get out of the way, but fully knowing it's probably not going to matter. All right, let's see how you do. Uh, straight dexterity. Actually, no, dex athletics. I mean, you might as well just say straight dexterity. <laughs> Ooh, uh, what do I need? Uh, well, it's a bolt of lightning, so ten. One success. <laughs> One success. So you back up so that it doesn't strike you right in the face, but instead gets you dead center of the chest. And your world, for a brief moment, becomes burning, searing fire as the electricity races down your limbs, ignites every one of your nerve endings. You feel it going up your spine, into your brain, and all of a sudden the world 
seems to fade, but it doesn't fade to black. It fades to an array of scintillating colors growing brighter and brighter as they come in from the sides. And before you, sort of like these silver globes of this great tapestry of darkness passing you, uh, you can see snapshots of your life. Snapshots of other people's life. You see your aunt whizzing by as she's yelling at your uncle that you rarely ever see. He's pissed drunk in a stained wife beater sitting on the couch uh, with vomit crusted in his beard. Uh, your father hard at work at a job that you don't remember him working at. Uh, you see yourself as an old man. You see a man that you don't recognize Another uh, and another man and a woman as they enter into a cave and the way that they're dressed seems from long, long, long ago. Uh, on some stage, there is a man uh, playing guitar, and then all of a sudden, as if from nowhere, his body seems to become enraptured in glowing orange flames. Uh, there is a woman in a dilapidated house, and she's kneeling beside a small child, and that child looks almost translucent. There is some sort of wizened old man in a laboratory, and he is just banging on something that looks like something out of mystery science theater. Uh, and hundreds, thousands of these come whipping past you. And they're gone. And you're looking down at the red clay and the running mud underneath your hands and the pouring rain. But there is a brightness. Though the, cl the sky is blocked out by clouds, there it, you, you find yourself in a bright light. Um... Looking around, looking up. Vasil, we love you, buddy. Vasil. <clears throat> looking around and looking up, can can I see anything besides like the red clay and this bright light? Yes, as you look up, you see what's causing the bright light, and there is an immense bird, scintillating, glowing from every fiber and hair of its feathers, almost like a being of pure plasma and light crackling as it beats its wings and you can taste static in the air. And slowly it sets itself down on the mountain ahead of you. And it cocks its head and from everywhere at once and nowhere, you hear in your mind, Well, Kedek, now what? And now we go back to Tom. You there, Tom? Oh man, if Tom fell asleep, I'm going to feel so bad. No, I didn't fall asleep. Cool. Huzzah! He's making a special midnight meatloaf. Ugh, I don't have that kind of time. All right, so you are you your your hand joined to your brother, uh, probably towards Athena's actually. Athena's holding on to you and your brother, and you are feeling along the walls of this dark cave, and it just seems to sprawl in all directions. Uh, do you go left or right? Right. You go to the right. Uh, right leads to a four-way intersection. Do you go left, right, or straight? Well, now I have to go left. Okay, now you go left. Uh, this leads to a five-way intersection. Do you go left, right, up, or down? Let's go up. Uh, you begin to slowly claw your way up an incline. And you find yourself in a six-way intersection. All of them seem to recede down into the earth and sort of twist away at odd angles. One through six, which would you like? I'll take... I'll take six. 
All right, so you go towards the furthest right one. You go down, and you are sort of bracing yourself against the slope. You walk for what seems like hours. You really can't tell how long in the darkness everything seems to blend. And you hear the voice again. Yanis. But it's not just once this time. Yanis. 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 All different pitches, all different voices calling you from the darkness louder than ever. And as it happens... There's a tremor beneath your feet, and the ground splits. And I would like dexterity athletics from you. Oh. 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 Hoo-hoo. Oh, what's the diff? Uh, Six. Okay, I got two successes. Two successes. The most successes I could have gotten. So the ground seems to tremble and heave and then break into pieces. You see the the path almost seem to bifurcate and tilt in two separate directions as your brother, Angus, disappears over the crest of one and the, the tunnel comes collapsing down. On the other side is just you and Aethna as you grab on to a ledge and you, the two of you are hanging over this yawning void. And she is very heavy. What do you do? Uh, try to pull both of us up. Uh, roll strength. <laughs> oh no <laughs> what's the diff eight that's a negative ghost rider alright you pull her up but as you do so she slips from your grip and she disappears but as she falls the darkness below her seems to grow bright until it is blinding. It is a searing white light from beneath you. And the ledge that you're hanging on to begins to crack and splinter, and your hand comes away with a clutch of pebbles. You descend into this brightness. There's a sudden stop and a thud as you land hard on your shoulder. As you pick yourself up, your eyes begin to adjust to the brightness and you find yourself in this sweeping cavern full of crystals of all shapes and sizes scintillating colors and shifting through every colors of the rainbow and you hear the voices again yanis 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 and as they call you these flecks of glass rise from all around the room from the beds of crystal from the outgrowths and they begin to swirl you every individual piece and shard and fragment calling your name in a discordant chorus and it begins to whirl faster and faster around you until it coalesces and from this riot of movement it becomes vaguely still and what you see before you is this almost this, this human-like figure made of this ever-shifting shards, and in a hundred disparate voices at once, it says to you, Yanis, welcome. I think that is quite... I don't know if... what the hell is going on, Mike, you're just fucking stunned right now. Am I dead? Not yet, but tell me this, Yanis. Would it matter? Of course, but I'm trying to, trying to avoid that. Truly. And the, 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 the fragmented creature sort of rises to its feet. And it offers you its hand, and as it does so, you see each one of the little uh, 
fragments sort of turn and geometrically lock into place. So that the hand it proffers towards you is quite smooth. Slowly take its hand. Unsure what the hell I'm witnessing. The glass is cold, but from deep inside there's a warmth as it gently pulls you to its feet. So avoid it you have. And now what? What will you do with this life now that you've been given it, Yannis? Where's where's Agnes and Ekna? Aethna is not my concern, nor yours. Not now, currently. Maybe later anything's possible, but for now, what's important is you. What do you intend to do with this life, Yannis? If you survive, if you make it out of here, then what? You will just go back to being a farmhand, I presume, and grow food and perhaps raise a family and eat and shit and die. Is that it? Is that all you're good for, Yannis? I was learning the ways of the of the earth. The, the earth, I tell you. Did you now? Show me then. Show me these ways of the earth. I don't. I don't have my my materials. Then what do you need? Ah, uh, I need. I need pigment. I need a uh, ash. I need. I need specific kind, specific flowers of the land. Why, my friend, look behind you. I'm sure you'll be quite pleased. And as you turn, uh, sort of arranged neatly in this section cleared of all crystals is pigment and ash and a bed of flowers that seems to have no fucking purpose growing out of the sheer rock, but somehow it's there. You're you're some sort of trickster, aren't you? What are you? Me? A trickster? I suppose that depends. What are you? I don't even know if I'm alive. Take up the materials. Find out, Yannis. How does any man know he's alive? If not by the sweat of his brow by the legacy he leaves behind. What is a man's life but his actions? Boy, what is a miserable pile of secrets, but anyway. Oh, I set you up and you spiked it. Good shit. Then I'll try one of the rituals Aiden was teaching me. And what does this ritual do? Probably not a lot, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Uh, but what, what, what is the effect that Yanis wants to produce right now? Uh, want. He's trying to conjure some sort of light in the key. In this, you know, this abyss. I will remind you that you're in a cavern of scintillating crystals. But if you if you want light, we can do. Oh that. wait. Oh, uh, oh, is the is it all lit up already? Oh, okay. You're you're currently in a very bright room. 
No, it, I'm doubling down. I want, I want a flashlight. Do you want an actual flashlight? No. I, whatever the equivalent of whatever this ritual would produce as a light. Okay. By all means. Uh, so, what spheres are you going to use? Uh, I assume at this point I oh, I have a single dot in prime from from shamanism. Okay. Uh, diff four then. I got three successes. Yay! Three successes. Uh, so all the crystals around you begin to glow brighter. As the light from them begins to almost lift from their faceted forms and converge before you, glowing like a sun and blinding out the area all around you. Very good. Yeah. I think that was probably... <laughs> I think that blinding light will probably cause me to fall backwards. Oh. Uh, so as you stumble backwards, the, 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 the glass entity will catch you. Again, it's uh, arms folding down so you don't impale yourself on its barbs. So you have the power to make light. There's a great deal of power inside you, Yanis, but is this all you wish to do with it? Of course not. Do you, you think I want to die in this... in... running from me life? In this... in this... hell? Being chased by some... dirty Romans? Then where would you like to die, Yannis? I don't want to die. Perhaps that can be arranged as well. And we flash forward. And as Yanis is sort of... You are standing probably in the penthouse of a hotel on the balcony, staring out over the, uh, the glimmering lights of a modern city of El Paso. You're probably at the, the Camino Real. Just sort of with a wine glass in hand, reflecting on the past 2,000 years. What goes through your mind? There's a lot of light here. <laughs> but I think I can make some more. I like it. All right. Josh. Yes. Okay, well, I mean, we don't have to do yours if you don't want to. Oh, I said yes. I, I, I know, you just seem super on oh. Yeah, whatever, asshole. All right. Is Ani so okay, by the way? Is she coming back? Oh, no, she just had to go and step away real quick. Okay. Yeah, she's coming back. Sometimes I, I forget how to modulate my voice properly. If I go too long without speaking... <laughs> I no, get it. Same. It gets me in trouble. Too much, come back with too much stoicism. I remember you and I talked about this before, Tom. You, you you go too long without speaking and then your your brain just goes like how do we speak again? <laughs> how do words? It's like you know the words in your head, but how to properly move your vocal cords at the proper volume for some reason seems hard. Okay. Yeah. Years later, after that uh, gig in Austin. You uh, have a much better idea of sort of what you're struggling with and how to work around it. And after years of constant toil and practice and striving, uh, you have been signed for your debut album. And so are you, as you were sitting there in the studio, and you just sort of think about everything you've gone through and all the people that doubted you and all the times when your own body would spit in your face. What are you thinking of right now as the producers are fumbling with their boards and getting ready and you are about to record that first that first album that will put you on the map? 
He's probably sitting on like a an old worn out couch, guitar still in his hand, practicing to his skills. As he has his guitar case open with a picture of Jason Becker kind of stuck on the inside. All right. And you hear the the intercom in the studio sort of crackle as the producer says, All right, Friedrich, we're ready. Uh, go ahead. And the recording light clicks on. So he probably gets up, goes to the uh, goes to the sound booth, starts testing everything out, making sure all the uh, one final check to make sure the guitar is properly in tune, and then testing that uh, all the pedals are set up and working properly. As he waits for the metronome to tick off, and he starts playing. Okay. Explain to me your emotional state as you go into this, uh, this uh, song. That you're, you're recording the most important one first. This is the one that you you can decide where you want it in the album, but this is the one that you want to make the most impact on people. It's going to be the first song. Okay. How, how, do, how are you feeling as you begin to go into it, as your fingers are warming up and so far they're obeying, you're having a great day. That fear is always in the back of your head, but how, how are you feeling? It's probably a, a sensation of trying to let go and not think about it, and trying to enter a, a flow state where, rather than thinking about what he's playing, Friedrich is just playing And you do so. And as you begin to let go, the music becomes almost an extension of yourself. Your fingers flowing on the fretboard. And you can feel just this torrent of emotions uh, rising up in you. But foremost among them is, is pride and determination and you just let everything go and these emotions begin to almost flow out of you and you close your eyes and you f begin to see this image of yourself with these bright orange flames leaping off of you flickering against your skin but it's not dangerous or gruesome it is glorious you shine radiant like an angel as the flames dance in time with your emotions and you have this sort of out of body experience as the the music sweet and perfect and melodic almost seems to fade into the background. And you are looking down on yourself playing perfectly, every note in place, every chord perfect. What do you do? Probably let go. As instead of like uh, hearing the music, he kind of tries to, to feel it instead as a physical thing inside of him. You do feel it, but it's not inside of you. It's behind you. And as you turn, there's this great tower of burning flames sort of standing there and swaying, dancing to the music. Uh, swirling golden yellow uh, sparks of orange and red. And it says, hey, you see this, you hear this voice sort of booming out of it. Friedrich, welcome. <laughs> I've heard your voice before. At least I thought I have. It's there in that liminal moment when you and the music become one. They feel it too as he kind of points to the, the engineer and the audience. 
end. I wish they could feel it the way I do. And so I have to try to give them that. But I don't think I have much longer. So this has got to be it. Is that your will, Friedrich? Do you wish to not last much longer? Do you wish to go out in a single bright spark? Or do you wish to carry that torch with you? I want to burn forever. I can do nothing that you don't want wish to, Friedrich. But I can do everything that you do. Why don't you give me, uh... I would like you to encapsulate that feeling via your spheres somehow. What sort of magical effect would you like to lay into this song? The song's name is Tree of Life, and so it literally has life inside of it. Okay, fantastic. Um, Actually, it's called Tree of Life. The first song is called The Seed of Life. Okay. So, how many dots do you have in life? Three. Alright, give me a Arate roll at difficulty six. That is one success with a ten. Good enough. Uh, and sort of as you sort of channel this emotion, and you can see this tower of yellow flames flare in time, the other you, the out-of-body experience you, begins to play faster and faster as it's like halfway through its seven-minute face melter. And you open your eyes, and you are in your body once more, Again, not thinking about the music, but every note is perfect and flowing from you in this perfect divine harmony. And you look through the window at the, the producers on the other side, and they are just in awe. These are old, jaded producers that have done this for a long time. They've seen a hundred people come through here, and their mouths are gaping open, and they're wide-eyed staring at you, and you have touched something deep within them and as it's it's almost imperceptible but you know the old stage technician that's sitting there at the the little slider buttons uh you can see just a little bit of the gray leave his hair as it begins to darken and uh you know, maybe the uh, the the other guy, the owner of the the studio, who's sitting in on this, he's got a couple nicks on his face from shaving that day, and you can see them, just just slide close ever so slightly, as this music, this tangible effect of life, begins to suffuse you and the studio and them, and even though you cannot see this pillar of fire, you can feel it burning all around you, burning through the music and coming through every note. And you hear in the back of your mind, then let us burn, Friedrich. Let us kindle a new beginning. All right, and we will go to Anae again. So, it is years later for Katarina. Uh, your family has moved to El Paso, now that uh, Abuela is relatively uh, well off for the time being, and your family had a little bit of extra money to pursue a better life for themselves. But the spirits have never left you. Not quite. As you grew up, you always seem to see them from the corner of your eye. There's always these strangers that seem to come to you and Sometimes you can figure out how to talk to them, sometimes you can't. It's it's difficult. It's like being immersed in a language that you don't speak. And uh, one day, 
Kiki comes to you with a map of the city, this old dusty paper map that she pulled out of, you know, somebody's trunk somewhere. And she lays it before you and says, Hey, uh, I know this is going to sound weird, but uh, maybe we should go here. And she taps, like, this corner in Anthony, this random spot on the map. Um, I have full trust in Kiki, so I, I'm going to ask first if there's any specific reason. I've or got a really just... strong feeling that this will be good. Let's go, then. All right, so you jump in the car, and Kiki's just, like, excitedly on tiptoes, claws clinging to the dashboard as you drive, and it's just miles of, like, sand and nothing, and you get to Anthony, and you turn past the church, and there's this long, slow, meandering drive. And Kiki's guiding you the whole way. No, not here. Uh, turn left. No, keep going. Uh, two blocks down at the stop sign. And you ask where Kiki's taking it. Like, I don't know. But, uh, but you should go. And nods excitedly. Hey, yeah, no, I'm, I'm following Kiki's orders. And as you sort of are almost on the edge of Anthony. You come to this 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 ranch house. There's like space for you. You can see what might have been like an old horse run with like the fences and stuff, but it's long fell into disuse and dilapidated. And uh, Kiki taps your shoulder. Here, this is the place. We go here. We should go here. And you pull into the driveway. And there's this old ranch house with, you know, peeling paint and missing boards. And the windows are almost yellow for lack of being cleaned. I'm going to look around the outside first to see if I see anybody walking around. Um, perception alertness. What's the difficulty? Good question. Six. Two successes. Two successes. Um, there is fucking nobody here. Like, there's not even fucking birds and shit, and the only movement you see is, like, every once in a while the wind will, like, kind of jiggle a tree, and you're like, man, this is how every fucking horror movie ever begins. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Kiki where if, where they feel they should go, if there's if anything's calling to them, if they can see anything. And it points to the old ranch house, right there. I guess we're we're going in the ranch house then. But first, I'm gonna try to knock. See uh, if you, I get it. You knock, and you can hear some shuffling feet, uh, from within, and the door opens. And there's this sort of stooped, uh, withered, uh, older lady. Uh, and you can see that she's got, like, an interesting, eclectic array of necklaces. And uh, there's, like, amethyst and stones hanging from her. And images of the saints. Like, she's got one of those saint necklaces, too. And there's a couple, uh, more, like, Santeria images, like just these, this litany of necklaces hanging off her neck. And she sort of looks up at you and she smiles. This, this, this very warm smile and she says, I was wondering when you'd show up. Are you hungry? You look so thin. As she holds the door open for you. <laughs> um... I guess I'm walking in. I'm going to ask her name and who she thinks I am. Uh, well, you get to name her. 
Because uh, okay. you said that she was an old uh, brujita. Oh, one? yes. So, na name the old brujita. And don't say Agatha. <laughs> I mean, Agatha works in Spanish, too. Oh, it's Agatha now, yay! <laughs> no. Um... Emma. Emma? Okay. Is that spelled like it is in English? E-M-M-A? Yeah. Okay. As you come in this ranch house, uh, extraordinarily Catholic, some would say. Uh, images of the saints everywhere, and uh, you can clearly see that she's got a a Santeria altar uh, on one side, and there's a uh, sort of these like wall hanging esque depictions of like tarot cards, sort of lining the walls. This eclectic mishmash of beliefs, and she says, "I uh, was expecting you a week ago, to be completely honest. Uh, my own spirit guide." said you'd be coming. You're here to learn how to help the dead, aren't you? I'm going to ask if she can see Kiki. Kiki? Who's Kiki? My, my, my spirit guide. I'm I don't think the spirit guide is for me to see, darling. I think that's for you. Can you see mine? No, I don't think so. I thought not. Please forgive the look of the ranch house. It's become hard to keep up appearances at my age. So, and trembling, she sort of lowers herself into a rocking chair. And you can see that she's got this very old antique teapot as she pours a cup for herself and into a very conspicuous second cup as if she's been expecting you for a while. Can you help me then? You said you think I'm here for to to guide the dead. Is this something that I I can get, I can do? You're asking the wrong question. Is this something you want to do? I'd like to. I've always seen them around me, and I can't always help. But I think it'd be. It'd be nice to in most instances. Well, there are lots of things that would be nice to do. It'd be nice to donate to charity or to work at a soup kitchen, but you're not at one of those. Your spirit guide, your Kiki, must have felt something. I'm asking what that was. There are a great many things that you can do. Why spend that time, that power, on helping the dead? Well, I don't think very many people can. So if, I, if I'm able to, I feel like I should. So it's an obligation for you. This is... Something that you're forced to do. Not so much forced to do, but I'm <clears throat> grasping the opportunity that's being presented. And what would you get from it? Purely selfish reasons. <laughs> it, you know, helping other people always makes makes you feel good and if I can add a little bit of justice to somebody's life then I'd be glad to would you like to feel good would you like to Ooh, learn about like that justice question. yes I do would you, like to be able to help do you scare easily child a little bit 
you may find this uncomfortable. And she sort of offers you her hand. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. As you take her hand, she sort of grabs... She's not, like, holding on. Uh, but it's a... It's a bit of a firm grip. It's a deliberate grip, shall we say. And she shuts her eyes, and she whispers under her breath and calls a number of the names of saints. And as you look around, the color begins to drain from the world around you. And the inside of the ranch house begins to look completely different. Her decorations begin to fade, and what you see is this ancient peeling wallpaper and this uh, sort of splitting, dilapidated brick beneath it. Uh, the furniture is... What little furniture there is looks completely different. And you and her are just sort of standing. You were sitting, now you're standing. In the middle of the room, and there is just this overwhelming feeling of sadness crushing in from all sides. I'm going to ask her what she did. Where are we? Well, we call these the Shadowlands, dearie. Well, they call these the Shadowlands. Uh, we call them... That depends on who you ask. Some people think this is purgatory. Some people would call it hell. I don't think anyone calls it heaven. It's definitely not oblivion. Come. And she opens the door, and there's this fell breeze that sort of blows in. This absolute j j sickening darkness that overtakes you, and doesn't seem to affect her whatsoever. And I, what can I see outside of her house? Like, is it the same, the same as before, just bleak, or? As you look outside, that's a very interesting question. Um, there's not a lot of buildings, actually. Most of the buildings in Anthony are gone. You can see some of them as almost like this translucent overlay, as almost like a hologram that rises up from the ground. Um, you see an old dilapidated church. There's a couple houses clustered around it. Uh, and the architecture isn't quite congruous, if you will. Like, some of these houses look like they could be from the 1800s. Some of them look very new. Uh, and everything in between. And do I see any people? No. And, uh, Emma sort of says to you, Go ahead, take a walk. It won't take long, I promise. There's a reason that I'm here. Um, is Kiki still with me? Yes. She is, like, okay. clinging onto your leg, her dear life, as her eyes dart back and forth. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask Kiki if, if they feel anything. If anything calls to them now. Yeah, bad. Lots of bad. I don't like it here. But Emma wants me to, to take a walk? Yeah. Okay. Then I guess I'm I'm taking a walk. I'm trusting her. Okay. You walk, and there again, there's this chill breeze that blows around through everything, and it's so quiet. Like, even your footsteps seem to land with this muffled thud. Uh, perception alertness, please. Grimdark, what's up, buddy? Always glad to have you. What's the difficulty? Uh, we'll call this a four. One with a ten. So as you so as you begin to walk through this town that really isn't a town much anymore, uh, 
something immediately seizes you, or rather you re immediately notice something. There's not a single fucking animal anywhere. There's no birds, there's not even bugs. Like, when you when you got here, there was, like, flies and mosquitoes, but nothing. This place is completely desolate, completely devoid. And then, from one of the old houses, it seems to warble as if underwater. You hear the scream of a small child. I'm going to try to look in through the window. Uh, as you look through the window, you see uh, this little girl. And she looks like something out of like an old black and white photo of the 1800s. Like if you open an old history book. And she's cowering in the corner. And as she does so, there's this group of these horribly distended black shadow-looking creatures with these gaping mouths and these beady pinpoint white eyes as they just sort of lurch towards her hungrily. I mean, I gotta help. I guess I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna walk in. I'm gonna try to grab her and run out. So as you storm in, uh uh Dex Athletics, do it. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, we'll have this up on YouTube before too long, I promise. What was the difficulty? Uh, diff six. I got a one. And I got two ones. Ooh, that's a botch. So as you, like, run for this little girl, uh, you feel one of these distended creatures sort of reach towards you and it clamps its hand down on you. It is ice. Ice spreads up and down your arm. It numbs underneath your fingers and it lurches towards you. And you feel this intense wave of anger and hatred pouring off of this thing. What do you want to do? Um, I, I can tell that it's like, it's dead, obviously, right? I mean, everything in here is dead. Yes, it's vaguely humanoid, but horrifically distended. Its fa its features warped, like something out of Amigara Fault. <laughs> I don't think she's read that one. No. <laughs> oh. Josh will show it to you. <laughs> no, I'm okay. She's not going to want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm going to try to get it off of me. Okay. Uh, strength athletics. Uh, Josh, would you like to roll for the specter? How many dice do you want me to roll? Seven. What's the difficulty? Uh, you're going to do a standard six, as is Josh. I have successes. I got none. All right, so you try to shake this thing off, but it is its grip is brutal, and it pulls you close. And as you stare into its eyes, there's this immense feeling of nothingness. This image overtakes your mind of just pure, roiling blackness. This horrible, horrible futility uh, floods your being is this intense nihilism and there's this bright glowing light that seems to pierce the darkness and it drives it away uh, and as it does so these horrible distended specters sort of glance towards the door and <laughs> shriek as they sort of peel away and fly off into the distance and you see Emma standing there leaning on her cane and she says, This is your, uh, justice. Do you see now? And she nods, and the little girl is still, like, in a huddled in the corner. She's weeping, and she's staring at you with, and Emma with one eye. This is what awaits these poor, poor people that are left on this side that are... Oh, we lost Annie. Oh, no. Oh, shit. 
You should have drank more Ovaltine. Welcome back. I don't know what happened. Uh, it's Texas internet. Shit happens. But she says to you, this is what awaits these poor people that are stuck here. Or worse, either they become one of those ravening things, or they are pulled down into oblivion where they are completely undone. So I'm going to ask you one more time, is it purely selfish? Is this something that you just feel you should do? I think if I know now that this is what they turn into, if they don't get help, I ha I have to help. I can't, I can't just leave them. I can't just leave them like that. Don't tell me, darling. And she points to the little girl. Tell her. Um, I'm gonna go and grab her hand and and ask if, ask what her name is. Uh, she sort of, through sniffles and wipes her eyes, she says, oh, Juanita? And ask, ask her how she came to be here, like, what happened? She, I, 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 I got sick, and I went to sleep, and I, I didn't wake up, and... I, I can't find Daddy. I don't know where Daddy is. I'm I'm gonna look at Emma and ask her how I how am I how can I help her? What do I need to do? She sort of ticks her head to the side. You tell me, child. This one's yours. Um. I'm gonna look at Juanita and uh... I don't know. Uh, we can uh, we can narrate this if you want. You can just tell me what works out. What do you mean? What works out? Uh. What actually happens in this instance is not necessarily as important as the emotional impact that your character has. Okay. So, uh, you can tell me how, uh, how Katrina's prologue ends, if she is able to help this girl find peace, and what sort of impact does that leave on her? Mm. I guess, is there any, any, like... Well, I doubt it. Um, no, no, you tell me. You're 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 in charge here. You're the boss right now. I'm gonna try to. I guess I'll try to calm the little girl down and with with soothing words and uh, I want to say yeah, I help her, but I'm not, just not sure how. Okay, that's fine. So we can we can sort of go to a, through a montage uh, where you there, there's a lot of ghost rules in World of Darkness that you're not privy to. So uh, you essentially discover one of her fetters or the things that are that binds her spirit to this plane, and we'll say that you uh, you give it to a relative as her father died long ago, uh, but you're able to locate one of their descendants and you entrust this. This very important, uh, what would be important to a small child? Perhaps her mother's necklace. Her mother died uh, when she was very little. And this antique necklace has been lost in the family. And you give it uh, to her descendant and she is able to sort of pass on. And then Katrina continues knowing now what is at stake. And what befalls those spirits that don't receive help. Okay, yeah. I'm ask Josh to talk to me about the ghost rules uh so the the ghost rules don't necessarily I, i'm using big air quotes for that because the okay it's, we're nerds we know things <laughs> about the setting that don't necessarily need to apply to you okay okay uh yeah so what do, what do you think is the final scene that the camera fades out on 
uh, as, Kater as Katerina is, be is ready to begin this new phase of her journey. Um, I'd say it's when I when I give the the necklace and I'm able to see Juanita pass, so I'll see that and I'll um, walk back home with 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 Kiki and see like see learn that know that I need to do some research. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> and last but not least, we go back. To you, Kyle. As this great thunderbird sets down before you. Well, Kedic. Now what? Oh, we want to crack it? No. Um. <sighs> I probably want to slap a bitch. <laughs> I, I, I think in this moment he's he's kind of just a little lost for words, just taking in like this this sudden amplitude to all of his senses just like hearing color seeing sound like being able to feel things that he's never been able to it's almost kind of like uh he, he's always tried to capture this this sense of things and now he's being able to like see it so perfectly clear um with his own senses and just sort of realizing, like, he is everything all at the same time before this bird. Um, almost like he is this bird, in a sense, or a part of it. No, that's 100% just... correct. This, like, this the avatar is a reflection of you. Just, I, I'm at a loss for words. What, I... What, what should I do? What, an, what a question, Kedek. What a question. Forgive me if the answer is anything, but that is the only thing I can give you. Let me phrase the question another way. What would you do if you could do anything? You have the infinite tapestry of all creation before you. The threads are but yours to pluck. Which one, Kedic? Which one? I want to be able to help others see and feel what I see now. If you wish it, Kedic, so it will be. How can you do this? I... I'm not sure. I think... There's too many things in this world that are used to... be obstacles for people to even get close to anything like this. Like I don't Aunt think Karen they're... Was. Yeah. So like many her. people like Aunt Karen, so many like-minded individuals, all putting their infinite possibilities towards putting each other down. But not you, Kedek. You could be the force that pushes in the other direction if you wanted to be. It's true. If I could find this, why couldn't others? You have but to tell me how to make that possible, Kedek, and together you and I, you and I could set this whole world alight with inspiration. I, I want... be able to show and make people feel feel something that drives them to want more than than just where they are some something that lets them be free like this to let them see that they are as much of everything as they actually are then it shall be so 
and the great bird sort of extends its wing and turns it outward like a hand. You and I, for the ascension. I'm just going to, like, not even question it, just take his wing. And there's another bright flash, and where do you find yourself? Um... On top of the the fucking Double Tree Hotel. Um and I Oh, thank you, Grimdark. I we we, I, we try. I I want to like just effectively like create this huge tag down the entire side of the building of just like this bolting lightning bird just that like etched across the front in the glass almost of just screeches be free do it what spheres would you like to use for that uh i wanna i wanna throw in forces and prime forces and prime absolutely uh what's your highest sphere that you're gonna use uh, forces. Okay, uh, give me a diff six. Three successes. Three successes. All right, so explain to me, narrate this scene to me as you as you tap into the infinite and you send electricity coursing down the side of this building. Yeah, like, almost like pulling it from the, the, the clouds and just using the, that heat to just etch it into the glass and and uh almost try to use the the heat to like change the color of it itself so like th this isn't just something you can paint over it's like scorched into the side of the building all right i like it all right, and there's this great blinding flash that the sparks leap up rain down uh from beneath you and you see you've gotten some kind of commotion uh, but it's not a commotion to you, it's an audience, it's eyes to see, to be opened. And as you release this, this bolt of inspiration upon the masses, how do you feel? What goes through your mind in that moment? Um, just the, scor this soaring surge of, like, fulfillment, I guess, and, like, just the... Uh, fuck, what's the word? Like, like his adrenaline is just pumping with just the, the excitement of the, this whole moment of, like, like, I can bring my life to, or my art to life in ways that, like, I never could. And, and, like, maybe he really actually could do something to change things. And in the back of your mind, there is a voice. Whatever you wish to be, Kedek. We shall be. And that is our scene. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's going to be our session. Uh, did you guys have fun? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, did um, you enjoy yourself? Huh? Yeah, I did. How much experience for the session? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think traditionally I am supposed to give uh, XP for preludes, but I when have we ever followed the fucking rules? No, fuck it. Three XP for everybody. And Word. we're going to vote. Uh, so... If I'm not sure, Grimdark, if you know how this works, we might have a couple other viewers, but at the end of every session, uh, we vote for whoever you happen to like best. And it could be any reason whatsoever. Maybe you just like their shirt. Maybe they told a funny joke. Whatever, it doesn't matter. We're just handing out props and thumbs up. So, uh, that being said, Josh, would you like to start the vote for us? Oh, my vote. Let's see, I'll give it to Tom for the Agatha. The the six dozen Agathas. Yes. Kyle, where's your vote going? <sighs> Fuck, it's it's a hard one tonight. Jesus. I know. Uh, good. I, I'm gonna give it to Anai because I just love Kiki so much. <laughs> 
Island of Brigades are really cool. I knew nothing about them until... Same. Like, it's, it's so cool. It, it's also really cool to have you here because you teach us, like, cultural stuff. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> great. <laughs> now, now, now I need a... Now I'm going to feel pressured to make sure I get it right. Uh, Daystra also votes for Ani for doing a great job for her first time. Thank you. No, no. Uh, Real I, Alex 664. Be... First of all, hang on, sorry. First of all, thank you for being here. Second of all, we've always said, I don't care if you've been here for five minutes, for five seconds, you can vote for whoever the hell you want. It's just a, like I said, it's just a thumbs up, hey, good job. Also, we look forward to that, too. I'm sorry, Ani, I cut you off. Who would you like to vote for? Okay. I was going to vote for Kyle for getting struck by lightning. Bumbled into success. Or Yay. botched into success. Well, that was the I think you the term one. you're looking for is uh, failing upward. Yes. Uh, and Tom, who would you like to vote for tonight? Uh, I will vote for Ani. And why do you vote for Ani? Uh, honestly, for, <laughs> for Kiki as well. Kiki's pretty great. Uh, so, unfortunately, Kyle was the Thunderbird guy, Grimdark. Thunder. So, uh, I, I will assume that, uh, that that vote's going towards Kyle. Uh, Tom is the guy down here that was a, uh, Helvetian, uh, tribesman. I don't know if you actually saw him. I enjoy the accent. <laughs> also, the ST can't get, okay. uh can't get a vote because I can't spend XP. So, but thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Mazzy also voting for Ani for dealing with their dead grandpa. <laughs> well, somebody had to do it. Yeah, no worries, buddy. Kyle, look up Lichtenberg Scar. I'm guessing that since you got struck, you have one of those on your chest now. Oh, yeah. No, 100%. He's, he's probably going to hit up a tattoo parlor the next day and have that shit, like, etched so it doesn't go away. I was going to say, if you want, Kyle, I can just go up to you in Life 3 and just make it disappear if you want. Nah, like, he, I, I think he's going to hold on to that one. Just be like, or touch it, and then poof, it's gone. <laughs> He'd be so sad. Okay, so while I wait for more uh, more votes to come in, uh, I'm just going to give you a big pluggity do real fast. My book, Litany of the Destroyer, is available on Ooh. Amazon. On A, do you mind? Uh... Yes, that is me. I wrote that. It is about a knight during the Hundred Years' War fighting demons. Uh, if you enjoy World of Darkness and the Dark Ages stuff, I think you'll like it a lot. Uh, if you're on YouTube, there's going to be a link down there. If you're on Twitch, I really should have a link ready. I don't. Uh, yeah, just search my name or Litany of the Destroyer. You'll find it, probably. Uh, with that, I'm not seeing any more votes. So, uh, Anahi, I think you've won the you've won the vote tonight. So you actually get a bonus experience. You're at four. Hell yeah! Oh. Thanks. Thank you. I'm. I, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I am, and thank you everybody for being here once again. Super, super. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Super privileged to have you fine folks here to play nerd games with me and just do wonderful shit with and you fantastic folks in the chat are just we we could not do this without you we could but it would be extraordinarily pathetic so thank you for saving us from our own patheses i don't know i don't think that's a word but it should be so i'm going to stick with patheses doesn't matter if it's a word or not because you saved us from it thank you one and all you're wonderful and we appreciate you um anything else we want to say to these wonderful people And while that I can love you guys. Well, that happens. I will search for. Well, I can love you guys. Well, that happens. Oh damn it! Damn it! For... Crap! Well, I can love you guys. Well, that happens. Oh, oh damn it! Damn it! I crap. I did a infinite uh, infinite sound loop because I opened Twitch and I should not have opened Twitch. And you'd think I'd have learned by now, but no, I don't learn. No worries, Grim Dark. Happy to have you here. Yeah, you guys here. Yeah, dude, it's cool just to have you. Um. All right, our friends Coffee Cat are live, but I think they usually log off around now, so I don't know if I want to do Probably that. Why is still going? Uh, yeah. I mean, we usually log off an hour earlier, so I'm not so sure about that one. 
Uh, anybody have any suggestions? Uh, negative goes right. All right, we'll raid Quincy's tavern. He's a cool guy. He deserves it. Oh. All right. Hang on, I'll just... Oh, I can't copy-paste from there. Uh, we'll just be go ahead and ban Daystra. <laughs> <laughs> no! I think Daystra is the most consistently banned and modded person in our entire community. <laughs> Probably. He's, he hasn't been banned or, mo or modded once. Actually, I think, you, I think he's been modded once. I think he was modded at least twice, which is more than anybody else has been modded. So, and we haven't banned anybody. My point still stands. Drunk modded. <laughs> I don't think I was drunk. I think I, I was hoping that you would, you would uh, time out him. You never did. So I took it away. All right. Uh, anyway, Quincy's a cool dude. Uh, go send him some love. I have no idea what Coral Island is, but uh, yeah, thanks for being here and spread the love. You guys are awesome. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> All right, everybody.